It's day six of Advent of Code, and we're about to solve another puzzle using functional programming in JavaScript. This time we're given a string, and we're being asked to look at each substring of length four until we find the first one that contains four unique characters, and then we'll return the index of where that substring ends. So compared to the last puzzle, this one is much more like a classical algorithmic coding challenge. Let's give it a try. We'll start by pasting in our sample input, and then since we want to go through this string, basically doing the same thing over and over again, I want to use a recursive function. So it's going to take in the string as an input, as well as an index that's going to start at zero. We want this function to look at the substring of length four beginning at the given index, and then we're going to count how many unique characters are in that substring. If there are four unique characters, we're going to return the index plus four because we want the index of where the substring ends, and otherwise we're just going to repeat this whole process for the next index. Getting the substring is pretty familiar. We're just going to use dot slice for that. So it'll start at index i, and then it'll go up to, but not including, index i plus 4. And then to count the number of unique characters, we're going to use a set data structure. So the reason we're going to use a set is because it naturally disregards repetitions. So basically, if we add the same character more than once, it'll just count it one time. So basically, we can add all the characters of our substring to this set, and then measure the size of it, and that'll tell us how many unique characters are in the substring. And then for these last two things, those are determining what we're going to return, so we can sort of do that in one using a ternary operator. We'll just say if the unique count is equal to 4, we'll return i plus 4, otherwise we'll return the result of calling this function again with the same string, but the index plus one. And now we can try out this function with our sample input, and we're getting a value of seven. And that was the answer in the puzzle description, so that's a good sign. They did give us lots of other sample inputs in the description, but I think we can just jump right to the puzzle input. Since our puzzle input this time is just one long string, I think it'll be okay to just paste it right into the IDE because it's not going to crowd it up with like 4,000 lines at the start. So let's go ahead and run this, and we're getting a value of 1,578. Well, let's see if that's the right answer. Oh wow, we already got the answer. Okay, perfect, let's take a look at part two. It looks like part two is almost the exact same thing, except instead of substrings of length four, it's just substrings of length 14 now. So we could start by trying to just replace every four with a 14 in our code and see if that works. We're getting a value of 2,178 now, and wow, that's actually the right answer. <laughs> okay, well, that was pretty fast. Let's see if we can improve our code at all. So we wanna practice the concept of dry, which means don't repeat yourself. So what I'm gonna do is basically modify this function so that it can accept any kind of window size, whether it's four or 14 or whatever. So I'm just gonna add another variable here. I'm calling it window size because it's like a sliding window that we're looking at here. And I'm just gonna replace all the 14s with window size. And we'll have to remember since this is a recursive function and we're calling it again, we need to call it with that window size once again. Otherwise it'll have some problems. And now we can just specify whether we want a window size of four or 14, and we can calculate the answers of both parts just using the same function, which is nice. Now this function is probably good like this because it's got a lot of comments. It's pretty straightforward and easy to read. But if we wanted to, we could consolidate it a bit. We do have some variables that we're only using once, so we could just replace those with the actual definition of what we calculated. And now we're actually only returning one thing, so it no longer needs to be a multi-line arrow function expression. It can just be this input-output style arrow function. And look at that, we almost don't have any lines of code left. All right, so there's one other thing I wanna say about our solution here, which is that we're given a puzzle input where it's gonna be guaranteed that we're gonna be able to find a substring of length four or a substring of length 14 with all unique characters. But what if the substring we were looking for didn't exist? 
So for example, if we were asking for a window size of 40, we would never find it because there just aren't that many lowercase letters for them to all be unique. But right now, since we're just asking the recursive function to keep calling itself until it finds that substring, it's just gonna keep going until we run out of memory. So let's build in a safety measure by first checking to see if we've actually gone all the way to the end of the string. And if we have, we'll just return negative one because we're basically saying we couldn't find it. There's no index that had that substring of unique characters. And now we can see that the function fails much more gracefully by just giving us this negative one if it can't find the substring. So again, that's something we're not gonna have to worry about for this particular puzzle input, but it's a good practice to get into for when we're building recursive functions because we don't want a maximum call stack exceeded error. So our function is working, it's nice and cute, and it's pretty fast. But you might be looking at this and thinking, well, on every call of the function, you're taking this slice, which is gonna make a new string in memory and then a new set in memory from that. And these slices are largely overlapping. And especially if the window size was something huge, wouldn't that be really inefficient? And that's a great point. So I kind of want to compare this to a more traditional solution to a problem like this if we weren't using functional programming. A more traditional solution would take advantage of the fact that there's so much overlap between the substrings we're looking at, and so it would only pay attention to the ends of the sliding window, in other words, the places where the changes are being made. So we can have an object that counts the occurrences of each character within our sliding window, and then a variable that counts how many unique characters we've encountered. On each iteration of our loop, we're gonna increment the count of the character at the right side of the sliding window, and we can use the nullish coalescing operator to set a default value of zero in case we haven't encountered that character before. If it turns out that the count of this character is now one, then that means we've found a new unique character, so we'll increment unique count by one. And then we'll decrement the count of the character that we've now removed because it was on the left side of the window. And if the count of that character is now zero, that means we've lost a unique character, so we'll decrement unique count. If unique count ends up being equal to window size, then that means our whole sliding window is made up of unique characters, and so we'll return the index here. If the loop ends and we never find it, we'll return negative one. So now we can see that this function is working, we're getting the same values here, except it's more efficient because we're really only doing up to four operations on each iteration of the loop, and we're not creating any extra data structures in memory or anything like that. It would be really nice if we could do something like this in functional programming, but because of our principle of immutability, we wouldn't be able to just modify the character counts object or the unique count variable. We'd have to create a whole new object on each iteration, and so that would kind of defeat the purpose because we would just be creating a whole new object in memory each time anyway. So I'm just going to keep it like this for now. But if you want an extra challenge, what you might want to try is solving this using a reduce. You've probably noticed by now that in functional JavaScript, reduce and recursion are kind of like the two cornerstones that we're going to use for almost everything. So we tried it with a recursive function. You can try it with a reduce if you want. Anyway, that's going to be it for today. Thanks so much for watching. And remember, the first step is believing you can do it. Bye.